Stone Butch Blues, Chapter 8 You made grade 5? A butch cheer went up from the plant cafeteria. All right, way to go. All the butches clapped me on the back and shook my hand. I felt euphoric. Butch Jan put an arm around me. You done good, kid, she said. I blushed. How'd you do it? Frankie wanted to know. Actually, I didn't know why I'd been selected for the job. Maybe it was for the same reason a lot of factory jobs were opening to us. All the young guys were getting drafted left and right. I'd been at the bindery for six months. It was a huge factory. Grant and I had got jobs around the same time. Two months later, when the Educational Materials Division opened, several more butches had been among those hired. Nine of us, almost the whole team, I'd played softball with last summer. Nine of us. It was heaven. Since I'd been in the plant for a while, I knew the ropes and was already in the union. So occasionally, the other butches came to me for advice about problems on their floor or about the union. I enjoyed the unpredicted reversal of roles. I worked with Jan in the training and folding division, giant machines folding huge pieces of paper stock that were trimmed into pages. Stacks of pages were loaded on the skids near a massive collating machine. Women ran from skids to feed fresh pages into the pockets of the collators. The pages dropped into a moving belt. The woman at the end added cover sheets and stapled them. I stacked the finished booklets into skids. Every once in a while, I got pulled from this work to help unload the trucks bringing in skids of fresh paper. I looked forward to it because it meant driving a forklift. The only part I didn't like was feeling a little dist distance from the other woman. Not one of my co-workers was ever taken off the line for any other task. One morning... The foreman replaced me on the line. Goldberg, come on, Jack commanded. I followed him into the shipping department. Wait here, he said. Tommy made a face behind Jack's back. I hate that guy, he told me after Jack left. He reminds me of this officer I had in the Navy, always ragging me. I hated his guts. I nodded, but I didn't speak. Tommy was okay, but I didn't know if he'd repeat anything I said. Tommy looked at the clock. Almost break time, he said. God, I hated the Navy. Two years of my life they stole from me. I used to watch the clock all day. They could force me to do anything, but they couldn't stop time. Sooner or later, they had to let me out. I shrugged. So why'd you join? Are you kidding me, he asked. So I wouldn't get drafted into the Army. LBJ and any guy who can walk over to Nam. Jack came around the corner with Kevin, his assistant, and Jim Boney. Damn, I hated Jim Boney. Hey, Tommy. You making a real woman out of Jess? Booney taunted. Tommy leered and grabbed his own crotch. Come on, Jack ordered me to follow him. I looked back at Tommy. He mouthed the words, I'm sorry. I mouthed the words, fuck you. Jack led me to a giant folding machine that was idle. I watched as he took out his tools. Now watch, he ordered as he began to set the machine for a different size fold. I couldn't believe it. This was an apprentice job. No one else was allowed to learn the mysteries of setting up a job and repairing the machines. Apparenting, apprenticing led to a journeyman's card. My hopes fluttered. You set the vertical, same way, Jack said. He grabbed a rag and wiped oil off his hands as I tried to set the vertical folds. No, like this, he corrected. The lunch whistle interrupted us. After lunch, he said, I flew up to the cafeteria. Why do triumphant moments have to be so fleeting? Just when all the congratulations had died down, Duffy, the chief shop steward, approached our table. Table, Goldberg, can I talk with you for a minute? I motioned to the chair next to me. Sure. He gestured towards the door. By the time we got out into the hall, I had a feeling I knew what this was about. Duffy, don't tell me that there's some fucking reason why I can't bust the barriers to a number five grade. He folded his arms and looked at the floor. Listen, Goldberg, I know you want that grade, and you deserve it. No one in the plant has ever gone higher than a four, and none of the guys except one have ever worked lower than a five. It ain't right. I narrowed my eyes. So? He sighed. So I'd be willing to file a grievance to get you and any other woman a grade five job, just not that job. I wanted to punch him out. Why the fuck not, Duffy? He put his arms lightly on my shoulder. I shook it off. My fists were balled at my sides. Listen, Goldberg. Jack and Boney are setting you up. I was confused. 
What's Jimboni got to do with this? Duffy pulled out a back of cigarettes and offered me one. I took it. You know Leroy? Well, he's grade four. Most of the time they have him sweeping up. I exhaled slowly. Shit, I didn't know that. Duffy nodded. He's been bidding for the grade five job for more than a year. When Freddy got drafted last month, Leroy told Jack he wanted the job. Jack kept, Jack kept stalling him. Leroy finally came to me and asked me to help him fight for the job, so he filed a grievance. The picture was coming into focus. Jack is using you. Boney's a union man, but he's such a fucking racist he'd rather block the j he'd rather block with Jack than work with the black guy. Leroy deserves that job, Duffy added. Well, so do I, I argued, but I said it without much steam. Duffy could see me wrestling with what he said. Yeah, you do, and I'll help you push to get a higher grade job if you want to fight for it. Just not this job. Stick with me on this one, Goldberg. It's really important for the union right now. Why now, I asked. Our contract's up at the end of October. The company will do nothing to split us up right now to make it harder for us to strike if we have to. We need to stick together. I sulked. Look, Duff Duffy. I'm for the union, you know that, but butches can't ever come to union meetings. Butches can't even come to union meetings. Duffy looked confused. I explained to him that we were allowed to drink downstairs at the union hall, but we weren't allowed to go upstairs to the meeting. Who says, he wanted to know. That's the way it is. That's the way it's always been, as far as I've heard. Duffy put his arms around my shoulder. Look, help Leroy win this one. As soon as the strike's over, you get the butches together, and I'll get as many of the stewards as possible, and we'll all go into the ratification meeting as a group, and insist on your right to be there. It sounded like change. I guess, I told him. But how come we have to wait till the end of the strike? He knitted his eyebrows. Well, we don't. It's just that it's going to be an explosion about Leroy, one way or the other. I'm trying to hold things together. This summer, so I know that we're strong if we need to strike, you know? I shrugged and nodded. The lunch whistle blew. I panicked. What do I tell Jack now? Jack came around the corner as I spoke. You ready, he asked me. I took a deep breath. I don't feel good, Jack. I'm punching out. I'm going home. Jack glared at Duffy. Suit yourself. Duffy whistled as Jack left. You're all right, Goldberg. I smiled grudgingly. Call me Jess. The next morning, when the whistle blew, I took my place at the collating machine, ready to feed the pocket. I could see Duffy and Leroy talking to Jack. Duffy was waving his arms and yelling over the din of the machinery. Jack had his hands on his hips, and his face was all red and blustery. When I looked over a minute later, Leroy was working on a machine with Jack's assistant. I had to hand it to Leroy. Those guys were going to make those guys weren't going to make life easy for him. As it turned out, they weren't too pleased with me either. You son of a bitch, Jack yelled in my ear as he walked past me. Jim Boney was glaring at me from across the room. Jan was on the other end of the correlating line, watching everything. The hardest part was telling the butchers at lunchtime that I was back to grade four. It ain't right, Grant said sullenly. Johnny and Frankie glanced at each other and shook their heads. Jan just watched the situation unfolding. I told everybody every about the promise. Duffy made me get all the butchers into the union meetings. Big deal, Grant laughed. The kids like Jack and the beanstalk, you know? She trades a cow for magic beans. Fuck that shit. I don't want to be part of no union that doesn't want me. My face burned. We can't just say fuck the union. We're in it. The contract's up in October. What are we going to do? Go into the plant manager's office one at a time and negotiate? We don't have a choice. We got to make these guys see that they need us too. Grant thumped her fist on the table. I got a choice, she said. I don't want no part in this union. You sold us out, kid. Fuck you. The whistle blew. Lunch was over. Everyone got up and went back to work. I stayed at the table for a moment, trying to remember what it was like to feel so good the day before. I would have done almost anything to get the back the respect I lost. Jan was still at the table. She stood up and put her hand on my shoulder. Come on, kid. We're late. I stood up and sighed. I felt defeated and raw. Jan looked me in the face. Life's complicated, ain't it, kid? I nodded, unable to look her in the eye. She gently touched my cheek on her calloused hand. I think you did the right thing. I remembered something my English teacher told me about not looking for approval for doing what you think is right. 
but I needed Jan's approval so much at that moment that my eyes welled up with tears of gratitude. From that day forward, Jim Boney began to bait me mercilessly. Hey, suck this, he'd shout to me across the shop floor. Nobody wanted to take him on, partly because he held sway as a bully, and partly because he was so tight with the foreman. What am I going to do, Jan? I moaned over a beer. You gotta fight him, Jan told me. I didn't want to fight Jim Boney. I was afraid of him. There's no other way to stop him, Jan said. I knew she was right. Two weeks later, Jim Boney pushed me too far. I was bending over to grab some sheets off the skid and felt something in the back of my thigh. I swatted behind me and touched flesh. Jim Boney had pulled his cock out of his pants and rubbed it up against my jeans. I felt dizzy with fear and nausea. The worst part was that Jim Boney saw the look and recognized it. He and Jack laughed at me. All the women were watching in sight instead of working. So the bootlet spilled off the end of the line and scattered on the floor. Jack shut the machine down. It got real quiet. Leroy called Jim Booney an asshole and told him to put his little dick back in his pants. Booney pushed Leroy and then squared off to fight. You fight with me, Jim Booney, I shouted. The burst of bravado started me as much as it did everyone else. They were brave words, born of fear. Come on, you want to fight? Let's go. Everyone looked at Booney. He smirked at me in such a smarmy way that I knew he wanted to reduce me to the same helplessness I felt minutes before, but I refused. Come on, I told him. What are you afraid of, huh? Getting your ass whipped by a bull dagger? Duffy came running up and then stopped in his tracks. He watched the standoff. Jim Booney lunged forward and Jack and Kevin held him back, but I could tell Booney was struggling too hard to kit me. I didn't know why Booney wasn't eager to fight me, but it emboldened me. I've had it up to here with your shit, Booney. We all have. Do, you fu do your fucking job and leave me alone or else I'm going to pound the shit out of you. Jack and Kevin looked at Booney to see what he'd do. He let go of his arms. Booney waved his arm at me as though he were disgusted and turned away. She ain't worth it, he told them. She ain't worth shit. As Booney walked away, Duffy shouted to him. She's a better union man than you are, Booney. Jan shook my hand. Duffy clapped me over the back. Atta girl, Sammy the truck driver patted my shoulder. He's a jerk. Walter the repairman caught my eye and nodded his head once in my direction. All right, Jack yelled as he turned the machinery back on. Get back to work, all of you. None of us would have attended the union picnic if it wasn't for Duffy. It was his idea that I should organize all the butchers to come. And you can bring all your girlfriends, he added. Jess, do you have a girlfriend? The, t the look on my face answered him. He knew he was just trying to get to know me better, but that was not a great place to start. Jess, he said, did I say it all right? Girlfriends, I mean. I laughed. You're all right, Duffy. The other brooches weren't all that wild about coming, but Jan understood that it would be a breakthrough, and she promised her lover Edna what would, co would come as well. Once Jan said yes, the other butchers agreed. We brought our baseball equipment. Once Abba's reopened in the spring, we had formed the Abba Dabba Doos softball team. Jan and Edna and I sat under a tree. Duffy brought us a bottle of beer. I like him, Edna said after he left. I smiled. I do too. Jan patted my shoulders and told Edna, the kid's becoming a real union organizer. Ah, I am not, I demurred. Hey, kid, Jan told me. We can use all the unity we can get. You've been doing a real good job on the you've been doing real good on this job. Trying to hold everything together. Take a few bows, okay? I swelled with pride. Edna stood up. I need a cup, she said. I studied Jan as she walked. I studied Jan as she watched Edna walk away. Her face was filled with pain. I'd unconsciously noticed the weight of Jan's sadness lately, but I hadn't really thought about it. Jan looked at me, and she let me see a little further into her eyes than I usually do. I tried to show her how much I cared about her before I spoke. You okay? I asked. Jan shook her head slowly. I think I'm losing her, she said. My stomach clenched. Jan slapped my thigh. You gonna no I'm going to get another beer. You want one? I stood up with her. No, but I rested my arm on her arm. If you ever need to talk, you know... Jan smiled and walked away. Duffy sat down next to me. Hey, Jess, you're the only one I know who I could ask this question. I felt flattered. I wanted to ask you about Ethel and Laverne. 
Duffy said. I looked around. Are they here? Duffy shook his head. Too bad, I told them. He always wanted to meet their husbands. Duffy spoke carefully. What's the sport story with Ethel and Laverne? Are they lovers? No, they're both married. You know that. Duffy fumbled for words. Yeah, but aren't they butches? I understood what he was driving at. Well, they're he she's, but they're not butches. Duffy laughed and shook his head. I don't get it. I shrugged. There's not much to get, really. I mean, they look like Spencer Tracy on Montgomery Clift, but they really do seem to love the guys they're married. Duffy shook his head. But they're inseparable. Don't you think maybe they're lovers and they're afraid to let people know? I thought about that for a moment. Geez, Duffy, it's not like they're getting it much easier by being married. They're still he she's. They've got to deal with the same shit butches do. Imagine Laverne going into the ladies' room at the movies, or Ethel at the bridal shower. I don't think people who give them a rough time give a fuck who they sleep with. It's probably harder for them, too, I added. They don't have a place to go like we do. I mean, like the bars. All they got is their husbands and each other. Duffy smiled and shook his head. The way Ethel and Laverne are with each other, I was just sure they were lovers. Oh, they love each other all right. You can see that, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're hot and bothered for each other. They really understand each other. Maybe each of them are just like looking into the other's mirror and seeing a reflection that smiles back. Duffy put his arms around my shoulders and hugged me. You're very smart about people, he said. I blushed with pride and pulled away in embarrassment. I'm going to get some food. I heard Grant's voice rising before I saw the confrontation. She was shouting nose to nose with Jim Booney. What do you mean you don't want no fucking girls on your team, she yelled. Booney shouted in the direction of the other guys. Because we want to win, don't we, guys? He smacked his fist into the first base mitt. Hey, Booney, I called out as I strode toward them. You talking about softball? We'll kick your ass. A silence fell over the picnic. For one thing, everyone knew this was about a lot more than a softball game. On the other hand, baseball was sacred to these guys. The thought of playing against girls bordered on heresy. If they won, where was the victory? If they lost, it was too humiliating for them to consider. Even the bushes stared at me with horrified looks on their faces. But it was too late. My boast hung in the air. Come on, Booney, I said. We'll challenge you to three innings, and we'll whip you too. Booney sneered. Bet you won't, Goldberg. The way he said my name made me realize how much he also hated me as a Jew. I smiled. I bet your gloves we will. The groan melted off Booney's face. He loved his first basement. The way most people love their puppy dogs. He kept it in his locker at work every day, even in the winter time. And if you lose, he countered. All eyes turned toward me. The smile grew back on Booney's face. If you lose, Goldberg, you gotta kiss me. Ew, yuck, everyone moaned. Some of them spit on the ground for emphasis. Come on, I told the other butches. Let's get our equipment. Jen shook her head as we gathered on the fields in a huddle. I don't know about this, Grant muttered. Look, I admitted. I made a mistake, okay? I knew in the minute the words were out of my damn mouth. I'm sorry. All we can do is play our best game and take the consequences. And I'll take the consequences. Grant threw her glove down and put her hands on her hips. We'll all pay if we lose. That's what's so fucked up about it. Frankie intervened. She said she was sorry, so let's win, okay? That was easier said than done. The men's team scored two runs in the first inning. We couldn't seem to handle the field at all. I wondered why we were playing so poorly. After all, most of the guys weren't in great shape. We played every week. Maybe we were intimidated because we believed they were better than us. I suddenly got a sick feeling in my stomach when I realized three innings may not be enough for our team of he-she's to overcome our fear. Come on, I said as we huddled between innings. Can we show them we got power? We scored two runs, but the guys scored two also. We were two runs down between innings. Frankie asked what would happen if we tied. Jan exploded. Listen to this shit, she growled. Why don't we just admit we lost the game now, huh? Why even play another inning? Her voice got real low and menacing. This is no fucking joke. You just think what I'd like to have to watch Jess kiss Jim Booney. I'm not going to stand by and let that happen. That was my friend, Butch Jan. We took our positions to play 
and play we did. We scored three runs, five to four, our favor. But when Frankie headed into home plate, Jim Booney smacked her in the back so hard with the ball she hit the dirt. We all charged Booney, ready to kill him. Jack and his assistant closed ranks with Booney. No one could tell if all the men were squared off against the Heishis or if it was just those three guys against us. Duffy rushed up between the butchers and the men. Jack, you took Frankie out, you fucking bastard. If you're down one man, so is your team. You're out of the game. Bullshit, Booney waved his arm around. It was a fucking accident, that's all. We wanted to kill him. The bet's off, Grant shouted. You fucking cowards, Booney said. The bet was back on. Duffy paced. This was a mistake, he muttered. Yeah, I asked him angrily. Who are you rooting for? The Union, he shot back at me. Then you better hope that our team wins, not Booney and Jack's, I told him. Duffy mulled that over for a second and then smiled. You're right. Duffy clapped his hands on and shouted, Come on, Jan. As she headed to the plate, Jan hit the ball up high in the air. We all poised and watched it fall, right into Jack's glove. It was our third out. We were up one run, but our opponents had another inning. Sammy was up to bat first. He hit the ball smack into Grant's glove. Before he dropped the bat, he gave me a wink. I could see all the way from my position on first base. Tommy was up next. He hit a weak grounder that Grant scooped up at third base, but he didn't make it to first. I'm sorry, he whispered. Fuck you, I said. I was still mad at him. Jack drove a low grounder into the weak spot in center field and lopped toward my base. After Booney gets done with you, I want sloppy seconds, Jack sneered. I tried to keep in my mind on the game. Walter was up next. He stepped up to the plate, tapped the dirt off his shoe with the bat, and wiggled his butt into position. He hit a pop fly into the air. We all pushed our caps back and watched it fall easily into Jan's glove. Walter pulled the brim of his cap and walked away from home plate with a spring in his step. Booney stepped up to the plate. We directed every bit of our hatred toward him, but he seemed unscathed. He swung at the first pitch with power and missed. Strike one, we yelled. He swung angrily at the second pitch and missed. Strike two, we called in our elation. We began to heckle him for all we were worth. The crack of Booney's bat against the third pitch silenced us. We all looked up into the sky as the ball seemed to float in midair. Tommy hovered around third base as mesmerized as we were. Jack ran toward third base and shouted at Tommy to run. Jim Booney slid towards first base. The ball fell with a plop right into Grant's glove. It was the third out, so there was no reason to throw the ball to first base, but she did. The ball landed in my glove with a whack. I braced my arms as I extended the ball on the glove toward Booney's nose, which was rapidly approaching me. There was a little snapping sound as his nose hit the ball. The game was officially over. We'd won. I didn't have to kiss Jim Booney, who was now bleeding all over first base. I would have claimed it was an accident, but no one asked. I caught sight of Jack glaring at me, always the foreman, even at the picnic. His menacing look chilled me, but I let it go because almost all the guys from the other team came over and slapped us on the back and said that they were glad we won. I realized these guys had just lost a team of heishis right in front of their wives and girlfriends, but they didn't seem sore about it. The butchers were happy about winning, but they hung back a bit. I knew they were kind of peeved at me. I was a cocky challenge. I had hurled at Jim Booney. I could have turned into a defeat for all the butchers on the job, and they knew it. It was Jan who broke the ice. All's well that ends well, right, kid? She put her arm around me. I think I'd have died before I let that you kiss that guy. I looked shocked. You didn't think I would have kissed him if we lost, do you? Tommy ran up, out of breath. Good game. He extended his hand. My expression was frozen, but I shook his hand. Look, I'm sorry, okay, he told me. I shrugged. You're not a bad guy, Tommy, but in front of the other guys, you sink like a stone. I just don't trust you. He opened his mouth to speak, but no words came out. Jan and I walked away. You're pretty hard on him, she said, but I'm sure you had a good reason. Attention, everyone. Can I have your attention? It was Tommy on the top of the picnic, ta picnic table. We all came closer. He had Jim Booney's prized baseball mitt in his hands. On behalf of the losing team, I'd like to award the winning team this first baseman's mitt. Well, he stammered, first base mitt. He tossed the glove to me. You all won it fair and square. 
Edna waited till Jan walked away from me before she came over. I saw the same deep pain in her eyes as she watched Jan from a distance. I wished a woman loved me that much. As Edna approached me, her mouth twisted into a teasing smile. She held my face lightly in both hands. Good game, Butch. I shifted uncomfortably from foot to foot. Ah, Edna, you know. She nodded to silence me. Yes, I do know, but it came out just fine. We both noticed Duffy standing nearby, waiting to congratulate me. You were right, Jess, he said. He told me, as he pumped my hand. The Union did win the game. My first instincts were wrong. I'm sorry. I got myself a nice cold beer and a piece of fried chicken, and sat down alone under the tree. The air was hot, the breeze was cool, and I felt on top of the world.